Right, we'll start. All right, shall we start? Uh, welcome everybody to another edition of the RAD RAR Colloquium. Very pleased to have the roads at last. Uh, our speaker today needs needs no introduction, so I'm going to introduce him anyway. Uh, this is uh, uh, Professor Ian Haywood, who is actually, well, he's based at Oxford University, but he is uh, technically a visiting professor here at RAT, the Rhodes Center for Radio Astronomy Techniques and Technologies. Uh, due to obvious circumstances, he has been largely non-visiting over the past few years, uh, but now he is making up for lost time, so it's great to have him here. Uh, Ian is renowned as a kind of a black belt radio astronomer uh, who has made some of the most stunning images with radio telescopes, most famously the galactic center image that Meerkat was inaugurated with in 2018. And in fact, my advice to you, if you plan to build a radio telescope, uh, get someone like Ian to use it first because he will make the most beautiful images for you. Uh, he has also been instrumental in my career, I have to say, because uh, my own specialization is making tools. And if you're going to make tools, you need a black belt power user like Ian to make you famous. So my advice to any students who want to grow up to be tool makers, find yourself an Ian. And if you just want to be a radio astronomer, also find yourself an Ian because he is also a great radio astronomer. Not to mention a very good friend of mine. So I'm very pleased to introduce him today and give the floor over to him. Uh, we have a whole bunch of remote participants on Zoom. Please, if you have questions, please put them in chat and we will address the questions at the end of the talk or raise your hands on Zoom when during the question period and Ian will uh, take your questions. They have noticed that he's a software engineer. Matt Lebowski is the system administrator. Recently hired Mark Rutendena, who is working on the CPU programming side of things. And a wider team of the also in various tasks. We have to show you some of the uh, results from two projects that have been finished with the Thank you. You're very well. Really to do next two days. So, uh, today, Peter Ma from Toronto. Yes, I'm my best. country. Please feel free to contact me anytime. I'd be happy to uh, yeah. hold it. I'd be happy to talk to you at any point, um, at any time, about any of the, any of the things I'll, I'll present so to you today. Um, so I'll, I want to cover three things. So these are the three projects that I've, I'm going to be talking about. These cover a range of kind of astrophysical applications and indeed observing modes with the telescope. Um, and I'll, I'll probably spend about 10, 15 minutes a piece on each of these. Um, hopefully show you some nice images along the way, explain a bit about the science, the data processing that you can do. Uh, and, and then we'll wrap up. Um, I'll start with an overview of MeerKat itself. I'm not sure if any geologists have wandered in by accident. Um, if, if so, I can I can introduce the telescope. I guess the rest of you will be familiar with this, but um, MeerKat's located here in the Northern Cape province um, in South Africa. This map shows you a population density map of the country. Um, and the reason that you build a radio telescope in the pale regions of this map is to avoid the, the human generated artificial radio emissions yeah. that can, can really ruin your day as a radio astronomer. Ian, I'm terribly sorry to interrupt. Well, over there the site, is... you'll see a scene like this. So you see these uh, these dishes that have mushroomed out of the desert now. Uh, in this in this rather beautiful background, this rather beautiful environment, with the telescope is situated in. Indeed, many of the residents of this building have probably got lots of interesting things to say about this. It's uh, really quite a stunning landscape. But as you can see, quite barren, quite remote. With the advancement of um, zooming in further, you'll start to see the dishes themselves. So Mirka has 64 of these dishes. Uh, they have a primary reflector that's 13 and a half meters in diameter. Um, as well as a sub-reflector there, and at the focus of, these, of the secondary, you can see the receiver carousel. Presently, this houses three receiver bands. Um, there's the UHF, which ultra-high frequency is paradoxically the lowest frequency. Um, L-band, which is kind of the workhorse of the telescope at the moment, and the forthcoming S-band, which covers those frequency ranges there. Um, this has been developed in conjunction with the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Germany. Um, a kind of more schematic view of the antenna layout shows you this. So Mika has 64 of these dishes, but it's got a very cent centrally concentrated distribution of antennas. Um, this, this is by design. Uh, and then surrounding this dense core, you've got these outlier antennas stretching out to a maximum separation of about eight kilometers. Um, so this 70% of collecting area inside the inner kilometer um, is what makes this a fantastic imaging device for reasons I'll explain shortly. 
Uh, but these outer antennas give you the higher angular resolution details, so you can get quite good angular resolution with, with Meerkat, as well as having this fantastic imaging capability. It's also an extremely capable spectrograph. It allows you to de deploy about 32,000 frequency channels maximum at any one time. And another one of its truly redeeming characteristics is the fact that this machine is extraordinarily sensitive. So these rather esoteric units that you see on the screen here are basically uh, a ratio of the amount of light you can gather at any one time, your collecting area, uh, divided by how cold your receiver is. So that, that is the sensitivity. So um, if these mean very little to you, then take it from me that this is an extremely sensitive machine. And something that never happens in radio astronomy is that this thing was 1.7 times over the spec. Usually it goes the other way, right? So this is, a, this is really, um, really down to the, the, the phenomenal talents and hard work of the, of the people who made it in, in South Africa. Um, yeah, so when you, when you see the layout of an antenna like this, an antenna array like this, it's probably quite tempting to think of each of these dishes as like a pixel in a CCD camera, right? But um, it, it's not actually the case. So the, uh, the fundamental measurement that we make with the radio interferometer actually comes from the cross multiplication, the cross correlation of pairs of voltages from these antennas averaged over some small time interval. Um, and what this measurement corresponds to is actually one Fourier component of the radio sky. So if you were to Fourier transform the radio sky, you sample that with a pair of antennas. <clears throat> um, when we calibrate the instrument, we're basically calibrating the individual gains of each of these antennas so that the cross multiplied measurement is actually you know, scientifically valid. Uh, and this corrects for basically the instrumental uh, electronic gain drifts, for example, as well as atmospheric effects, for example, from the troposphere and the ionosphere. So the shortest telescope spacing lets you see the largest angular modes on the sky. So it's just a diffraction equation, basically the wavelength divided by the shortest baseline. Correspondingly, larger angular separations let you see finer details. Um, so if you have n antennas, you have n into n minus one over two baselines. So the nine antennas that you see here, which forms one of the three arms of the very large array in New Mexico, would give you 36 baselines. The VLA itself actually has this Y shape, it has three of these arms. So the 27 antennas in total give you 351 baselines. 64 antennas from Meerkat gives you 2016 baselines. So you can see how this number kind of scales with the, with the number of antennas. Um, one of the tricks we use when we're observing with a telescope like this is we, we observe the sky, but we allow the rotation of the Earth as we observe over a long period of time to change the projection of these baselines. And this increases the number of Fourier components of the sky that get sampled. <clears throat> there is a bit of a headache in doing this process though, which is the data rate. So the number of visibility measurements you get is the product of the number of baselines. So for Meerkat, that's 2000, number of channels, 30,000, number of polarizations, which is four. And then the length of your observation time, which might be eight hours divided by um, uh, how long you average over for each of these measurements. So every time the correlator clock ticks, it delivers this number of complex numbers to a hard disk somewhere. Um, so a several hour observation with a modern radio telescope can produce a, a database of hundreds of billions of visibilities. And that's the raw product that comes off the instrument that um, we, we kind of take and we calibrate and, and we process into a scientific product. So the way that's usually done is you basically take all of these measurements and you, you plonk them onto a two-dimensional grid. Um, so these are the visibility amplitudes. It's a complex valued uh, quantity. So obviously there's a phase, uh, phase equivalent image uh, to the one you see here. This is an example from the VLA. And once we plonk these measurements onto a grid, we use a fast Fourier transform and that then inverts the visibility domain, the Fourier domain into an image of the sky. So here you can see the example of a nice tailed radio galaxy here. You can see the, the jets coming out of the central supermassive black hole. Um, but you can also see there's kind of this spoke-like pattern around it. So the aperture synthesis technique is when you're synthesizing a big aperture by having lots and lots of, of dishes. And the synthesis imaging technique is when you're synthesizing an image of the sky by making um, uh, uh, data processing or deconvolution techniques that compensate for the fact that your, your aperture isn't complete. We have these missing, um, missing Fourier modes in the, in the data. So usually what happens is we deploy some form of deconvolution, usually some variant of the clean algorithm, uh, and that allows us to basically end up with our final science product. So you can see that we've gone from um, you know, something that looks not very handsome there to something that looks quite beautiful there by compensating for the, the point spread function of the instrument, which is uh, quite riddled with side loads. So that's my whistle stop tour of Meerkat and synthesis imaging. Of course, the, the process is a bit more complicated than I can explain in a couple of minutes. Um, but you see that it's a huge data rate problem. It's a big data problem. Um, it's a huge algorithmic and mathematical challenge uh, to, get these, to get these reliable images. And it's something that, that gets worked on quite industriously and successfully here, here in Rhodes is this kind of data processing techniques, deploying and developing new, um, new computational and algorithmic methods to, to meet these challenges. <clears throat> um, I'll come back to the data processing in a bit, but I just want to introduce a few of these projects that, that I intend to talk to you about. So um, these are a mixture of Meerkat large survey projects. So these are kind of community-led um, programs where the observatories promise to deliver you know, 
many thousands of hours in the year to these large survey projects, these flagship projects, as well as kind of observatory led legacy projects that were basically deployed uh, in pursuit of commissioning the telescope to make sure it's um, you know, ready for scientific use. Um, I liken this to kind of sea trials for a boat where you know you have to you test the boat on the ocean. The easiest way to determine if a radio telescope is working properly, just point it at the sky and start doing astronomy with it. Um, the first one of these is a, an extragalactic um, deep fields project. It's a galaxy evolution survey called MITEI. I won't expand these acronyms, they're universally terrible. Um, if you want to know more about this project, then you can uh, look up this archive link here. Um, this is led by Matt Jarvis at Oxford and Russ Taylor at UCT. Uh, and basically, this survey is going to cover 20 square degrees of the sky using 144 pointings and about 1,000 hours of L-band time. We've actually observed more or less all of the L-band time so far, so we're making good progress. The end data products of this will be full Stokes imaging to sub-2 microjanskis per beam. Um, this is confusion limited, which means you know, you're, you're going so deep in the map that all the sources are kind of blending together. Um, rotation measure synthesis from the, the polarized imaging. Uh, as well as um, fine spectral line cubes for, uh, for H1 detections and OH maser detections. So in continuum, we can basically detect something like the Milky Way at a cosmological redshift of one. So a look back time of, I don't know, five, six billion light years. Um, and as well as H1 line detections to redshift of about 0.5. So the, the H1 line is extremely intrinsically faint. You need a decent amount of observing time as well as a machine that's as sensitive as Meerkat to, to detect this thing at cosmologically significant redshifts. Um, but these are kind of some of the outstanding questions in modern galaxy evolution. H1 is the raw fuel supply that powers star formation and ultimately turns the, the you know, the, the pristine H1 supply into, into beautiful structures like galaxies full of stars and black holes. And it's interesting to see how that fuel supply evolves into galaxies over cosmic time. Uh, just to cement the data problem in your mind, the survey has about two and a half petabytes of raw visibilities and that will reduce to about half a petabyte of image products. Um, hopefully we'll get an additional tier with S-band covering seven square degrees for a typical synchrotron spectrum. And we also have access to the continuum data from the LADUMA survey, which is um, MIRCAT's ultra deep neutral hydrogen survey, uh, a single pointing in the Chandra Zoop field south. So, what does radio tell you about a galaxy where well, you get synchrotron emission? This is relativistic electrons uh, being bound to a magnetic field and then radiating at, at sub five gigahertz or thereabouts. And free free thermal emission emits in the radio are, are greater than 10 gigahertz. Um, the polarized intensity lets you probe the magnetic fields in galaxies as well as the uh, magnetic field of the of the line of sight between you and the galaxy and then spectral lines the motion of these spectral lines the doppler tracking of the spectral line with frequency allows you to detect the motion of the gas around these galaxies in the aforementioned atomic um, atomic h1 transition as well as uh, cold molecular transitions redshifted into higher radio frequencies in co and c2 um, and then there's things like oh mazes which trace dense regions of star formation so everything with the star here you basically get from the mighty survey itself and we've got instruments um, uh, access to other instruments that allow us to also expand this, um, this uh, the frequency coverage to regions that Meerkat can't see to get the others. The multi-frequency, multi-wavelength aspect of the survey is in fact key. So one of the reasons that MITEI targets these specific, specific fields is because they're regions that have really very good uh, coverage at other wave bands. So here's some beautiful um, five band infrared for photometric data. You can see the, I mean, it's, just, it's like a few square degrees in, in the XMM field. There's about 1.2 million galaxies in this field. So basically everything that we detect in MITEI will have an optical counterpart for. This allows us to get a cosmological redshift, which we can then invert into a cosmological distance. Start doing studies of how galaxies, galaxies form and evolve over cosmic time as a function of their environment. So the current state of the art for extra galactic deep fields is probably this one. This is the, the three gigahertz Cosmos survey from the VLA from uh, Smolchitz et al a couple of years ago. Uh, and what we're gonna do with MITEI is this. So we're significantly expanding the coverage to deeper depths. Um, as well as, uh, as well as having the spectral line capability as well. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about the data processing, um, just to show you how you go from kind of that raw visibility set to, uh, to a final image. And MITEI is quite a, good, a good, uh, good, good example with which we can do that. So you probably can't read this slide, but it's, uh, if you're familiar with any, any observation from the VLA, for example, you'll see that the typical setup is the same for Meerkat. Um, we observe a few calibrator sources. So this, this mess that you probably can't read in the middle is basically a timeline. So this shows you that we alternate between scans of a calibrator source, which is something we really know the behavior of, use that to calibrate the instrument, transfer those gain solutions onto the target, and then proceed. Um, so after you've done that calibration, you have to flag out the interference, which L-band is, is endemic and a complete pain in the neck. Um, but after that, you've got your calibrated RFI-free, hopefully, visibilities that you can then invert into an image and begin the deconvolution process. So this is one of the pointings from the LASS-1 field in the MITEI survey, and I've chosen it because it's particularly horrible. So just for some context here, oh boy, this projector is really letting us down here. 
Uh, just for some context here, so uh, the green circle, which you may or may not be able to see, is about the 30% power point of the, the antenna primary beam. The green square is, uh, the green cross is my pointing center. And then off to the left, we've got this horrible bright source here. So I'll just step through the data processing steps that we've, we've done for MITRE and other surveys. So we do a, a blind deconvolution, basically, to try to find all the sources in the image, after which we identify all those sources, and then we repeat the deconvolution, only allowing it to proceed where we think there's a genuine source. And the reason for this is once we've got a genuine, um, once we've isolated all the genuine sources and deconvolved them, uh, by deconvolving, we construct a model of the sky, and then you can use that model to further calibrate the instrument via a process called self-calibration. So you can see by applying self-calibration, there's some improvement in the map, um, but it doesn't get all the way, right? This, this problem source off to the side is still causing us a headache. Um, this is because the general, general calibration uh, procedure is direction independent. So you have to employ advanced techniques, um, most of which have been developed by people in this room, um, to take care of things like this, uh, just by expanding the calibration. The, there's a mathematical model of the, of the process called the measurement equation. And by implementing arbitrarily complex measurement equations or, or um, more feature rich measurement equations, you can improve the calibration process. So to go from this to this, I've basically added an extra calibration term that only solves for an extra gain term in the direction of that bright source. <clears throat> um, after which to get rid of residual direction dependent effects, we basically chop the sky up into little patches and then start solving for each of those independently. Um, and you can hopefully, well, if you're super interested, we can gather around my laptop afterwards. But you can hopefully see that the final image is, is much improved by this process. Um, we then correct for the effects of the primary beam just to get the map into uh, intrinsic units across the board. And you can see that once this process is complete, we end up with a very nice kind of uh, almost artifact free um, performance limited image of the, of the center. Mercifully, we've been able to automate this process because remember, Mighty has two and a half petabytes of data. So we need to be able to turn this through a pipeline quite quickly. Um, I want to point on this slide. So this is a, you know, this is, this is kind of a software roll call. This is the, this is a list of all the software packages that, you know, I would never in a million years be able to write myself, but I certainly make use for. So I want to give credit at this point to, to all the packages that go into that pipeline. But I also want to point just how many of them have basically been developed by people at Rhodes or Rhodes adjacent. Right, like this, uh, a stunning amount of kind of algorithmic development that goes on here. And um, not only does South Africa have the best radio telescope in the world, I think the, the center of gravity in terms of the algorithmic and data processing side of it is, is really shifting towards this part of the world also. Um, so here's our first public data release. This is a three pointings in XMM, XMM and one in Cosmos. Uh, there's the full moon there for scale to show you roughly what the area of the sky is. Uh, and in recent months, we've moved from that to our first data release. So you can see a large area, large area observations now approaching, uh, approaching the, the, the final products for the survey, at least in continuum. Um, these are available internally to the project. Um, I'll come on to that in a second. Uh, yeah, and this just shows you the pointing grid. Um, this lower left one here, this is actually a single 125 hour pointing. So it's a, it's a very deep observation. If you remember one of Meerkat's headline um, uh, science results from a couple of years ago was the deep two field from, from Tom Mauchetal on the left there. So the, the mighty CDFS field has basically repeated that now in terms of its depth, um, as well as being able to use the advanced techniques to mitigate the strong source at the edge of the field. So we've kind of got a deep two like image, but remember the nice added thing about mighty is that we've also got redshifts for every single one of these radio sources. So we're, we're kind of approaching data products now where we can start doing real kind of leap forward uh, research in terms of this. As I said, the early science data are public, data release one, which is what I've just showed you is internal to the collaboration. Uh, the continuum working group leads are Catherine and Imogen. Um, the project is basically open. If you, want to, if, you want, if you want to do something with these data, then just drop Catherine and Imogen a line with an outline of, of what you want to do. And I'm, I'm sure they'd be uh, amenable to handing the data over. Um, like I said, radio imaging hasn't always been this way, right? If you're new to radio imaging or radio astronomy or otherwise unfamiliar with it, like I really do want to impress you on you what a leap forward this telescope is uh, in terms of being able to do um, studies like this extra galactic deep field. Um, but not only that, so there's obviously many applications. Um, so the second part of my talk is uh, on the general theme of time, domain, and serendipity. So this involves another two of Meerkat's large survey projects. Um, the first one is this Meertrap. So this is a PI'd by Ben Stappers in, in Manchester. And what this is, is it's a machine that sits in the back of Meerkat and continuously searches for fast, by which I mean kind of sub-second um, radio transients. So bursts, uh, radio transients that, that bursts and then disappear very quickly. Um, it achieves this by means of a GPU cluster, which searches uh, the, the incoherent beam that is just summing the, the voltages from all of the telescopes, as well as coherent beams that are formed by essentially beam forming each of those voltages to a certain direction. And it can search in real time up to 768 coherent beams, which are formed from the inner 40 antennas. 
Um, and there's a pipeline that basically identifies and detects these events in real time. Uh, and once it has a detection, it dumps a little, little chunk of visibilities that then allow you to image and then localize where the burst came from. It's a tremendous system. Uh, it operates commensally with basically all of Meerkat's general observing. So anytime you're using the telescope for an imaging application, this thing's generally running in the background and looking for these burst signals. So another such general imaging survey is this Thundercat. So this is PI by Rob Fender from Oxford and Patrick from UCT. Um, and this is a large survey project that aims to detect and monitor kind of explosive astrophysical phenomena. So these are things like, um, uh, well, given the game away there, these are things like uh, X-ray binaries, supernovas, gamma ray bursts, uh, flare stars, et cetera. Um, and it observes by means of a, a long-term monitoring program of known sources, as well as triggered monitoring of sources. So you might have a, a gamma ray burst that goes off. Thundercat can immediately trigger an observation of that and then start monitoring it with, with Meerkat. Um, so here's an example of some of the Thundercat products. So this is a movie of uh, GX339-4. So this is a galactic X-ray binary. It's, just, it's a, probably a few, a few solar mass, or maybe a 10 solar mass black hole uh, in a binary orbit with a, an evolved companion star. Um, and these things go into outbursts every so often and start producing these relativistic jets of radiation, um, as well as it end up being very bright in the X-rays. Uh, and one of Thundercat's kind of um, regular monitoring projects is to monitor this. So with just 15 minutes of data every week, this is an example of, of, of the sort of data you can get out of this. So with only 15 minutes of data, you can get a very good high quality image. Um, and you can see in the center of this source undergoing one of these flaring outbursts. Um, also serendipitously in the field, we detect this, this flickering source in the lower left there. That's actually an intermittent radio pulsar as well. And this is another one of the applications of Thundercat. If you're doing 15 minute monitoring of, of a patch of the sky once a week for, for three years, then because of Meerkat's large field of view and sensitivity, that really gives you a nice opportunity to study variability in the field objects, as well as find things that, you know, things that go bump in the night that you weren't expecting. So while Thundercat was observing this field, so this is the Valor X1 high mass X-ray binary, um, looking to monitor this thing for outburst. It also serendipitously discovered this beautiful bow shock that you can see there. So this is only the second ever detection of a bow shock from a runaway star in the radio. So this star is plowing through this nebula and as it does so, it's causing this kind of shock wave at the front of it. You can also see that in hydrogen alpha emission in the image in the top right there. Um, but while Thundercat was observing this field for, for monitoring Vela, the, the Mirchap folks got in touch and said, hey, our systems detected a burst during this observation. <clears throat> and this is what one of the, one of the, the Mirchap outputs looked like. So along the, along the X axis here, you have time, along the Y axis, you have frequency. You have this very characteristic kind of swept frequency behavior. And this is dispersion of the signal uh, due to free electrons along the line of sight. So they make, how does this work now here? Lower frequencies arrive later, higher frequencies arrive sooner. Um, so what the Mirtrap machine is doing is it's trialing lots of these dispersion measures and basically trying to correct for these pulses and then you know correct for the dispersion and align these things up. And it does that in real time also. So the, the pipeline that was triggered, uh, it has a go at, um, like, a, have I got a laser? Oh, sweet. I've got, it has a go at like fitting a best, uh, best dispersion measure estimate here, uh, then correcting for that dispersion measurement and give you a dispersion measure corrected pulse. So it's found the brightest peak in this, but as you can see, there's a bunch of substructure. So this was a pretty interesting object. Um, and the Mirtrap folks got in touch and said, can you have a look in the imaging data, which we did. Um, and by basically taking each of these correlator dumps, so every eight seconds, the machine is dumping um, enough visibilities to this to make an image. And then you can start making movies in time. So we caught this thing when it was off and then we caught it when it was on. So now we have an arc second position, arc second precision position for this object, um, at which point a monitoring campaign is to begin. So with thanks to Soreo for the, direct, the director's discretionary time allocation, Mirtrap was now able to put a dedicated beam on this source and just keep watching it to see what it did. And it actually turned out to be a pretty interesting thing. So I'm, I'm not a Pulsar expert, but uh, as far as I know, at least, you know, this, this kind of range of peak of pulse morphologies that you see here is, is, is really intriguing. It's got uh, many different morphological shapes in the pulse profiles here. These have been corrected for the dispersion. A particular interest with these quasi-periodic things here where you get this you know, rapid kind of pulse structure here and these partial nulling things where it just drops out like here. So um, this, this sort of structure is often seen in these fast radio bursts, which are extremely bright flashes of radio emission that you can detect halfway across the universe. There's a lot of interest in these things because it's still a bit of a mystery exactly what causes them. So if you can tie them to something like a, you know, a, a pulsar or a neutron star or a magnetar system that are fairly common in our own galaxy and then start monitoring these things, we might be able to draw, draw lines between the, these two phenomena. <clears throat> the classic plot that pulsar astronomers and uh, other types of neutron star powered objects 
tend to make is this, uh, this PP dot diagram. So this plot shows you the period of the object, its rotation period on the X axis, and then the period derivative on the Y axis. So this is a measure of how quickly the rotation is slowing down. You can time these things to phenomenal precision, which is why they're very useful probes of fundamental physics. Um, but the interesting thing about our object here, which is this J0901 thing, is it was beyond some of these so-called death lines. So as far as I understand it, most of the models that are invoked for pulsar emission is that they're extremely strongly magnetized. So if you imagine the typical magnetic field of a star, this thing you know, might be the size of, you know, I don't know, out to Jupiter's orbit or something. And as it collapses at the supernova, you know, the, this thing shrinks down into a neutron star, which is you know, maybe the size of Cape Town. And that magnetic field basically gets compressed accordingly, right? So you're squashing the magnetic field of a star into something that's as small as a city. So the magnetic, magnetic field strength is phenomenal. Um, and the, the notion is that as the rotation happens as well, you have this, uh, this electric field that interacts with the, with the magnetic field, and uh, that's what causes the, the radio beam to emit at the magnetic poles. <clears throat> um, so the fact, that this, the fact that this source here is beyond some of these so-called death lines, these are, these are lines for which a particular model predicts that the, the radio beam can no longer be sustained and should switch off. The fact that this thing exists here allows us to rule out a few of these models. And the question I've always had, perhaps a naive one, is, is this corner of this diagram uh, devoid of objects because they simply don't exist, or is it devoid of objects because we don't have the means to detect them yet? Um, I'll show you some movies of the snapshot imaging. There's some flickering images here, so if, you, if you're photosensitive, you might want to look away for a sec. But um, you basically chop the observation up into each of its eight-second snapshots, and you can basically see this thing, uh, this thing flickering on and off. Uh, I think this is about 40 times real time, this movie. So every 76 seconds, we get one of these radio pulses. So the usual bread and butter method of detecting these things is with a big single dish radio telescope where you, you time the pulses accordingly. But it's really nice with Meerkat to be able to start detecting these things in the image domain as well. Um, just as an aside, a nice rule of thumb emerges with Meerkat if you're doing eight second snapshot images or its other observing mode, which, which is uh, down to two seconds. So if you remember the kind of classic uh, pair of large area sky surveys from the very large array, a two second image will give you basically a square degree of MVSS and an eight second image will give you about a square degree of first, which is another, uh, another highlight of just how sensitive Meerkat is. In fact, over the observing campaign, we've detected every single pulse of this, of this object in the image domain. So here you can see just pulse trains from one, two, three, four, five of these observations. Uh, this middle row is the signal to noise, so extremely high signal to noise. This is some crude estimate of the spectrum in the image domain. But I think the nice thing about this experiment and this, you know, extremely fortuitous discovery, you know, we were just observing an X-ray binary and all of a sudden this thing popped its head up and now we're monitoring it. The really nice thing about this, the serendipity of this, um, makes us think that traditional pulsar search methods where you're, 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 um, uh, you're folding the signal over a range of trial periods and then looking for a, you know, coherent, a coherent, uh, coherent signal in the folded, folded time series, they generally don't extend to lengths of 76 seconds because it's a bit too expensive computationally to do the folding. So if we can start detecting these long period um, rotating neutron stars in the image domain by just routinely doing snapshot imaging of the data at all times, it might be a fruitful discovery method for objects of this type. We might start populating the lower right-hand side of that, of that PP dot diagram. That remains to be seen. Once I know where all the pulses are, of course, you can start doing other stunts. So basically, I know where all the pulses are in the data, so I image the data without the pulses. That lets us do things like search for a persistent radio source associated with this. So here's the radio source that exists in the map after you've averaged out all of the, uh, all of the time axis, and this is just the cumulative emission from all of those pulses. And on the right is the data without any pulses in, in, in the map whatsoever. And we can rule out a persistent continuum source, for example, from a pulsar wind nebula to a three sigma limit of about 18 microjanskis per beam. Another nice thing, uh, circumstantial of course, but intriguing nonetheless, as you can see this very faint radio shell around this object here. Uh, this might be the, super, the remnant of the supernova that created the compact object in the first place. So a massive star ends its life and uh, creates a, a neutron star or a black hole as a remnant. But of course, all the material blows off and forms these, these shells around the star in the process. Um, there'll be more of those in the galactic sense of it momentarily. Um, Snapshot imaging is my new favorite thing. So chopping up data into little, little images and just looking at the movies, um, some fascinating stuff emerges. So here's a good one. Uh, this came out of another time domain project and I thought, yeah, finally I detected my UFO, you know, like finally I find the aliens, but unfortunately there's much more mundane. This is actually a geolocation satellite going through the beam of the telescope. So you, at some point the F engine, you know, picks up the game ball and goes home in a huff. 
but you can see what a problem these things are, right? It just it goes through the beam of the telescope and you know it's game over for the observations. So there's constellations of these things in the sky at all the time, right? Otherwise your GPS system wouldn't work. So we have to be careful to avoid them. Sometimes one drifts right across the beam of the telescope. Um, not much you can do about that. Uh, if you see Elon Musk around town, tell him to slow down here. Um, the worrying thing for me is that when I made the full band continuum image or the time integrated continuum image, there was no obvious sign that anything was wrong with the data. The only reason I spotted this thing, I should have been more diligent and looked at the visibilities, but there are so many of them, we just don't have time. The only, the only reason that I spotted this thing was because this was for one of these projects that involved snapshot imaging. So, I mean, we've always known that a radio map can conceal a thousand small evils, but it can contain a small number of extremely large evils as well. So who knows what the, what the knock-on effects of this might have been in, in, in more subtle ways. Uh, one more example before I move on. Any takers, I guess, for this one, except Oleg, who's already seen it. This is actually the sun. So this is 76 degrees away from the face center. So um, I'm from the UK, so I'll never complain about the sun being up, but it's an extremely strong radio source and it's a source of interference and a bit of a headache to some of our observations. It's one of the brightest radio sources in the sky. So even when it's almost at right angles to the telescope, Mikat can detect it through the side lobes of the primary beam. You can then basically rotate to that position and make a fairly decent image of it. So if you look at the solarmonitor.org on the same day, oops, you know, we can kind of recover the Limbright and solar disk as well as these sunspot complexes in the, in the kind of solar tropical regions. So we need ways to deal with this. Um, Victoria's looking at this for MSC, so we're going to solve all our problems shortly. Um, yeah, so uh, on to the final part, the Galactic Center. Uh, how am I for time? All right, cool. Um, I'll break some water in that case, excuse me. The nice thing about talking about the Galactic Center is that it gives us an excuse to go right back to the beginning. Um, it's actually the first object ever to be ever to be observed, detected at radio wavelengths. So this paper here basically marks the birth of radio astronomy as a science. So this was published by Karl Jansky in 1933. It has the uh, frankly terrifying and amazing title, Electrical Disturbances Apparently of Extraterrestrial Origin. So Jansky was a telecoms engineer working at Bell Labs in the USA. And he was investigating sources of interference in transatlantic radio communications. And one such source um, couldn't quite be pinned down. It couldn't be understood. It wasn't thunderstorms. It wasn't the sun. So he's got this wonderful, uh, wonderful telescope here. I guess you can call it a telescope now. So these are the wheels on the Model, model T4. These are some bits of two by four and some dipoles strewn across them. Rotate this on a circular track to impart some directionality to the antenna. And with a painstaking amount of measurements of this source, Jansky realized that it was not repeating daily on a 24 hour cycle, but was repeating on a 23 hour, 56 minute cycle, which is the sidereal time. So whatever this source was, it wasn't attached to the earth. It was moving with the fixed background of the stars. So Jansky had an estimate of the position of this thing, which is uh, roughly in the direction of the constellation Sagittarius, um, and then kind of moved on and moved back to, to being a telecoms engineer. So although Jansky was kind of, you know, the, the father of radio astronomy and, you know, his name is the unit that we use today for the brightness measurements, um, I would argue that the first radio astronomer proper was actually Bill Reber. So he kind of realized the significance of Jansky's discovery. Lots of astronomers at the time didn't really take it very seriously. Um, and he was making, a, he constructed this nine meter parabolic antenna. You know, the design really hasn't changed much in the last 80 years. You know, you've got a primary reflector and a, a receiver up here and you measure a voltage. But again, with a, with a very dedicated and painstaking amount of, of time mapping the sky and the radio wavelengths and at multiple frequencies, Reber was able to make the first kind of all sky radio images. So here you can see the galactic plane here. Uh, this was Jansky's position. Uh, here's the actual peak. Jansky as a pioneering radio astronomer immediately discovered the joys of the ionosphere. <clears throat> um, but yeah, so Reba was really the only, the world's first radio astronomer I'd argue, but also probably the only one for, for many years. Um, as I said, the discovery of, uh, that Jansky had made was not really taken very seriously by astronomers at the time. And the reason for this was they thought that anything that was in space must be emitting uh, radio emission via thermal processes. And if you measure the brightness of the radio waves and assume that it's just radiating, radiating like a black body, the implied black body temperature is colossal, right? It's, it's, un, it's un, infeasible. Um, and it wasn't until really the 50s um, when synchrotron theory was, was, uh, was developed by Wechsler in, in Moscow and, and others that basically radio astronomy could become mainstream, right? We had a, a, an explanation for the origin of these absurdly high brightness temperatures uh, and a physical explanation for it in terms of the emission mechanism. 
And that really was part of the kind of post-World War II boom of, of doing radio astronomy. So after Reba's initial old sky map here, we have, you know, 30 years of basically bigger and better dishes. People just built larger antennas, give you higher angular resolution, more sensitive receivers, moving to frequencies like 15 gigahertz, which gives you higher angular resolution. And by kind of the mid 70s, we had maps of the galactic center that look like this. So you can see the galactic plane running diagonally there. It's been resolved into a bunch of kind of ridge and shell-like features here. Uh, and now they've got names. So this is Sagittarius A. This is Sagittarius B. Uh, radio sources have these naming conventions whereby the brightest radio source in a constellation is called A, second brightest B, etc. That's why you have the, the so-called A team, Cass, Cassiopeia A, Taurus A, Cygnus A, etc., etc. Uh, and indeed here we have Sagittarius A. <clears throat> But I think single dishes could only take us so far. And um, once radio interferometry was developed, uh, this was basically you know, the quest for high angular resolution by constructing a, a single dish that would give you the angular resolution and the, the kilometer is obviously infeasible, but you can split that collecting area up on the ground, use some of the techniques I introduced at the start of the talk and start making images of the sky at high angular radio resolutions. Um, and back in the eighties, this was the kind of the state of the art BLA image of the galactic center. Uh, and indeed this revealed a bit of a mystery. So these, these kind of parallel threads here, uh, first discovered in uh, 84 by, by Fahad Yusuf Zadi. Um, these, these have remained a bit of a ministry ever since. Um, here's a closer look. You can see they're really weird. Uh, they're extremely narrow, extremely thin. It's hard to imagine how you could get something so collimated, so bright over, over the kind of tens of light year distances that, that these things span. And these are only, only seen in the galactic center. We've never seen these anywhere else. Um, just like we've had 30 years of bigger and better dishes, this is 30 years of bigger and better interferometry observations. So these are some modern VLA observations of this thing. So at three and five gigahertz, we get high angular resolution. Um, the VLA strength is it's very good frequency agility, as well as the fact that those Y-shaped antennas that I introduced you to earlier are on, are on rail tracks. So a big tractor engine comes along and picks them up and then moves them further down the line. And by reconfiguring the array, it's like a radio zoom lens. You can get these extremely high angular resolution images of these things with the VLA. They're really quite stunning. You can see these threads are resolved into many, many parallel filaments here. Um, I'll be returning to these again shortly in the context of MeerKat. <clears throat> in terms of wide field radio interferential imaging, this image on the left here was really the state of the art for many years and it, it remains in my mind one of the most iconic radio images ever made. This is a 330 megahertz, very low frequency wide field image of the galactic center. And again, you see some of these sources now, Sagittarius A that I mentioned B. Now we're down to C, uh, D and E. Um, some wonderful names coming up, the snake, the mouse, the pelican, uh, many morphologically interesting features, but you can see the whole region is, is just saturated with radio emission, very bright emission on many angular scales. It's extremely difficult to image this part of the sky for, for this reason. It's very bright um, and morphologically complex. And to meerkat, so um, you've probably seen the orange inaugural image. So this is the, this is the kind of consistent reprocessing of that image. This is the, the best image I've made to date with this. So. You can see now how much of a leap forward in, in imaging capabilities this, this is from something like this to something like this. And you can see a huge range of interesting features in this. I've, you know, I've, I've, I've looked at this image so many times and I'm still never tired of it. It's, it's just awesome. So this is, this is now moved from equatorial to galactic coordinates. So the galactic plane's running horizontally across this image. Um, you can see the Sagittarius A complex here, B, uh, these filaments just all over the place. We'll have a closer look at some of this in a, in a minute. Um, just to give you a summary of the image, this was made from 20 meerkat pointings. This is now one of the uh, one of the commissioning observations that has since turned into a kind of public legacy survey. So about 200 hours of observations, of which about 144 were on the galactic center itself. The rest were calibrated sources. Uh, it covers an area of about 6.5 square degrees with four and a half arc second resolution. I think the image is about 780 light years across in, in real terms. Um, we chopped this up into 16 frequency bands so that we could get the spectral information. Remember, Meerkat has a very broad bandwidth um, receiver. We can essentially make false color radio images with this data, more of that shortly. And these are publicly available now. So if you want to play with these data, you can just pop onto the Soreo archive and, and have some fun. <clears throat> the region of the galaxy that these observations cover is a, is a very important one. It's known as the central molecular zone. So this is only about uh, maybe 400 parsecs across. Uh, it contains 5% of the galaxy's total molecular glass, uh, gas. Uh, the temperature in this region, the cosmic ray energy density in this region, the gas density in this region, all one to three orders of magnitude higher than the values in the galactic suburbs where we live. It's an extremely chaotic, extremely energy intensive, extremely, frankly, terrifying region. So it's a very good part of space to study. And again, not just at radio wavelengths, we, we, we must study these uh, other wavelengths to get a complete picture. Um, 
one thing I've always kind of wondered about with this image is, you know, how much of this stuff is in the foreground? Not all of this is located at the galactic center. Perhaps this could just be an, an interloping object along our line of sight. Um, I added this to the talk last week because I came across this paper. So this is a kind of a schematic top down, top down diagram uh, of, of the region now based on some really awesome work by uh, Yoshiaki Sukui, um, who's been looking at atomic and molecular gas velocity and then kind of trying to place these radio features um, on these kind of uh, on these kind of orbiting orbiting streams of gas. So you can kind of get a schematic now. So within the central molecular zone, you have this what's called the star forming ring that sits here with a radius of about 160 parsecs. If you look at this in, uh, in far infrared, as you can see with Herschel here, you get this kind of twisted infinity type shape. It's a twisted ring like structure. And in fact, most of the interesting features that you see in the Meerkat image uh, are orbiting the central supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star, is the wonderful, quite remarkable event horizon telescope image. Um, but most of these other features that we see, the ABCDs, they sit on this star forming ring and they're all in orbit around Sag A star itself. So you've got Sagittarius B, which is a, an H2 region, a star forming complex, Ditto Sagittarius C. Uh, Sagittarius D actually has a star forming region, which is this one here, as well as a supernova. Apparently that's a foreground object uh, and another molecular cloud complex star forming region, Sagittarius E. So these things are all kind of on this orbit around Sagittarius A star. I think the current thinking is that at the end of the galaxy's bar potential, you have this kind of, um, it's where the central molecular zone begins. So gas is flowing into the galactic center region along the bar and then entering these kind of orbits, stable orbits around Sagittarius A itself. Um, occasionally things peel off the inside of this and then fall into the black hole, at which point we can have star formation events from the, you know, 10 to the five solar mass molecular gas cloud gets dumped onto a black hole. Wonderful things are going to happen. Um, so just a closer look at some of these things now. Uh, this is basically just lots of gratuitous, nice pictures. Um, so this is, yeah, this is the Sagittarius D region, is the H2 region I talked about, as well as the supernova remnant. Uh, there's also this supernova remnant here. I really like this thing. Can't see it on the projector, but something's blown a big ear in this shell up here. Um, it's got like a, an elongation in the shell. If you have a closer look at this thing in the middle, you discover this kind of twisted complex of radio emission. And as I said before, if you if you have a pulsar, it must have been formed from a supernova remnant, a supernova like progenitor. And indeed, that's what's going on here. There's a there's a neutron star in the middle there. This is what's called a pulsar wind nebula. Um, this is the pulsar itself interacting with the environment. We've got this kind of preferential jet alignment here, and this is this is blowing ears into the shell of the supernova that created this thing. Again, I have mentioned the false color images we can make. This is a wonderful visualization made by Juan Carlos at ESO. So this then takes the the uh, the radio color information and then color codes the intensity by that. And you can see that the pulsar wind nebula has a decidedly different spectrum from the middle. Um, at least you can on that screen. You've got a nice blue colored thing over here. This is another star forming region. This is synchrotron emission. Um, this is probably a mixture of synchrotron and thermal and other processes. Uh, here's a look at the Sagittarius B region in, in false color. So again, you can see really nice um, compact features here. These are star forming cores where new stars are being born inside this giant molecular cloud. Uh, this looks like it's the same object, but as, as the Safui et al model shows, this is actually slightly closer to us on the star forming ring. Um, this shows you the nice power of the false color radio imaging. You see features here that are immediately distinguishable by eye. So you can see that these have a, um, a flatter or an inverted spectrum star forming cores. This is probably a background radio galaxy here that has a redder, redder color. This is a synchrotron radio jets there. Um, here's the Sagittarius A complex itself. So supermassive black holes in here. These are these ridges of uh, radio filaments. This is the super bubble. There's lots of uh, massive stars going supernova in here. There's, uh, I think, three distinct clusters that are undergoing bursts of prodigious star formation in there and blowing out this bubble structure. Again, you see these filaments everywhere. Um, another demonstration of why making spectral index or false color radio images is a nice thing. You can see the supermassive black hole in here. This blue feature here is previously known. This is what's called the galactic center mini spiral. This is material on kind of Keplerian orbits, um, very close to the supermassive black hole itself. But the Meerkat data reveals a feature that's not obvious in the total intensity image, right? You've got these, these features here that join the ends of the spiral. So possibly the dominant accretion flow into the supermassive black hole itself. Again, circumstantial, but intriguing. One of my favorite scenes is the mouse and the snake. So here you've got the snake chasing the mouse down the hole. Um, this is one of the more well-known radio, uh, non-thermal radio filaments, it's got these interesting kinks in it. Um, again, more, more supernova and neutron star action. So this is the pulsar that was formed when this, this star here went bang. Uh, supernovas aren't nice uniform things that happen, you know, nice and homogeneously. 
uh, they tend to happen asymmetrically. And quite often you can get the neutron star or, or black hole remnant getting pinged out of the system with an extremely high proper motion. And that's what's happened here, right? This thing's gone out the side of the system. So this massive star's died in a spectacular explosion, formed a neutron star that's kicked, been kicked out the side there to start a new life somewhere else. And indeed, if you time the end of this thing with a radio telescope, you detect pulses. It's very nice. <clears throat> Um, the Meerkat view of the non-thermal filaments, I think, has been pretty game-changing. So, uh, as I mentioned before, these are uh, these have been a bit of a mystery since their discovery 30 odd years ago. Uh, you can see in this image, hopefully, again, these things are just absolutely everywhere. A weird range of morphological types. You've got ones that bend and cross over, ones that bifurcate, weird kind of harp-shaped things here, all over the galactic plane. Um, the image is also awash with a lot of these background or possibly foreground in the galaxy compact features. So Isabella Romala, who I'm sure many of you know, has been working hard to, to, to detect and extract and, and classify and categorize these. So in addition to the image products that we've made public, there'll hopefully be a, a, a catalog of compact sources with, um, with their attributes available for general use soon. Um, the edge of this thing here is actually something that was one of the, one of the first kind of I think impressive results to come out of the, the Meerkat Galactic Center project. Um, so that was this one. This was the discovery of these bipolar radio bubbles. So these are 430 parsecs, about 1400 light years end to end. Um, and the inference here is that this was created by an explosive event in the galactic center about several, several million years ago. So whether this was due to something falling onto the supermassive black hole or due to a burst of star formation remains unclear. It's possibly both. But um, it was very energetic, about seven tenths of the 52. Uh, so several hundred supernovae, at least there's a, there's a kind of toy unit that astronomers like to use called the FO, which is 51 ergs. And that's the typical amount of energy that the massive star gives off when it goes bang. And then with some other inferences using uh, gas velocity measurements, we estimate that this was about, um, this occurred about seven, seven million years ago. Um, just as an aside, this thing's absolutely full of hot X-ray emitting gas. So this is hot, hot plasma that's emitting in X-rays. There's a very good correspondence between the, the radio shell and the, uh, the um, X-ray images of the galactic center, you can see in this paper, this wonderful work by Gabriele Ponti et al. So I think um, one of the things you have to worry about when you see a structure like this is, is it belonging to the galactic center or is it kind of some foreground thing along the line of sight and maybe we're not discovering evidence of, of activity from the middle of our galaxy. But I think this correspondence is, is um, with the X-rays is, 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 is fairly good uh, evidence that this thing is indeed being blown up by uh, activity from the supermassive black hole or, or its vicinity. Um, as an aside aside, you may wonder if we can detect such things in external galaxies and indeed we can. So this is some wonderful X-ray optical composites. You know, I don't think there's anything particularly special about our galaxy other than the fact that we're in it. So uh, you can find kind of analogs to those radio bubbles in external galaxies. This is NGC 3079. It shares many very similar properties to the Milky Way. Um, I was thinking about this kind of this kind of structure and then thinking about how we only see these radio filaments in the galactic center. Um, what are the prospects for detecting those radio filaments in external galaxies? So I back of the envelope what it would take to detect the radio arc, which is the brightest such complex in this galaxy. And unfortunately, it's kind of nano Jansky levels. So we need kind of you know, SKA plus plus for this kind of work. But I think we could certainly start using um, Mercat plus and instruments beyond that to start to resolve these bubbles in external galaxies. Um, the nice thing about um, our own galactic center is it's tricky to observe our own galaxy because we're in it, but our nearest supermassive black hole is only 20, only 26,000 light years away, right? It's extremely close. Bringing things back to kind of the mighty galaxy evolution stuff that I was talking about at the beginning, we know that supermassive black holes do have a profound influence on the evolution of their host galaxies, and it's still a bit of a mystery why. So I think our own supermassive black hole lets us have an opportunity to study the neighborhood of a black hole uh, with, with very good detail. And I think the Mercat radio data is going to play a big part in that. I want to end with uh, coming back to the galactic center filaments. So one of the one of the immediate things we noticed about this this structure is that basically all of the previously known and newly discovered filaments are more or less entirely contained within the bubble cavities, and they'll have this preferential north south alignment. So uh, yeah, and the bubbles are bounded by the longest of these filaments. So this this is the radio arc, which was you know discovered in 1984 in that in that scratchy image I showed a few slides back. This actually extends way up here and way down here, and similarly on this side. Um, the spatial density of these things also declines with increasing galactic latitude. So there's lots and lots of theories about how these, these synchrotron emitting filaments are formed. 
But I think with this data, we can start to consider whether uh, they're not a localized phenomenon that are being uh, generated and caused by, for example, you know, some activity around a particular star, but a more global phenomenon. So my favorite pet theory at the moment is that the event that caused these bubbles is actually the event that causes the synchrotron filaments. So instead of having an event causing individual filaments here and there, what we're seeing is a kind of global phenomenon. So we've got this big explosion that goes off in the center of the galaxy. This injects lots and lots of relativistic particles into the, uh, into the, um, into the region. And then what happens to these particles is that they then bind to the kind of in situ poloidal magnetic field of the galaxy. So it's like sprinkling iron, sprinkling iron filings onto a bar magnet where you see the magnetic field. This explosive event that's created these bubbles is sprinkling cosmic rays and relativistic particles onto our, onto our galaxy's magnetic field, lighting up these filaments, and then that kind of lets us map the structure of the magnetic field due to that process. One thing that would be awesome to do, and in, indeed we intend to, is to go back to the Meerkat data and start looking at these data polarimetrically rather than just in total intensity radio emission. You can then infer the magnetic field strength of these things directly. Um, yeah, so uh, just to plug a couple of other things that have come out of this, this is a high pass filtered image of, of this work. So I think these data are particularly game changing to investigate both um, uh, the goings on in the middle of our galaxy, but in particular, the origin of these filaments. So they're absolutely everywhere. And what we can start to do now is instead of just studying them one by one on an individual basis, is we can start to treat these things like a population and start doing statistical studies of their properties on mass as a function of kind of galactic latitude um, their brightness and, and in particular their spectral index. So recent work by Farhad with the Meerkat data has shown that there is indeed a galactic latitude dependence on the spectral index of these things, which suggests that there's probably a galactic latitude dependence on the age of the electron population that's powering them. Uh, and I think further fuel for that theory that what we're seeing here is something going bang in the middle of the galaxy and, and lighting up the magnetic field. Um, yeah, in conclusion, Meerkat's awesome. Um, <laughs> I'll plug these four papers. If you want to know more about anything I've talked about, then, then please look these up. Um, this is also the point where I, I give some, some acknowledgements. So uh, obviously, obviously, I haven't done all of this work alone. Uh, I want to thank Manisha, who is my um, co-author on the, the Neutron Star paper. Also, um, Rob, Patrick, and Ben, who are the PIs of those large survey projects. Ditto Catherine and Imogen, the Continuum Working Group leads, Matt Jarvis and Russ Taylor, who are the, the, um, uh, the PIs of that project. So Landon, Benjamin, Jonathan, Oleg, Cyril, uh, Bill Cotton, all, all, been, um, all been legends in terms of the data processing side of all of this stuff. Um, tremendous credit must go to them. Uh, Fernando for handing over the DDT time for this. Uh, but I think the real acknowledgement for these large lists here, so these are the Meerkat Builders lists. So um, too many to, to name individually, but um, I think the, those, those people are the real heroes of this talk. And I think the credit for all the, all the nice images I've showed you really must go to them in the end. Um, thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate your time. And if you have any questions, I'm around all day. So thanks. Thanks very much, Ian. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Unless you, well, unless a question requires it. Uh, would, if people have questions online, please raise your hands or post in chat. Uh, otherwise, we can take questions in the room. Go back first. No, you first. Can you show the going across the thing? One of the things that we've got to the so the online people the question was what are the structures that kind of emerge in the image around the satellite as it moves through the beam uh, so if you remember, the, the telescope has a, has a rather strange point spread function because of our incomplete aperture, and that hadn't been deconvolved from any of those images. So the satellite will be uh, will have these kind of point spread function side loads associated with it, and these wash all over the map. But I think also the satellite's so bright that the telescope itself starts to misbehave, and I think that also further corrupts the image. And then you, you can see as it gets to the center of the beam, that's where the telescope's most sensitive. And, you know, it's like a human looking at the sun. It's just like... It's, all bets are off at that point, I think. And then as it passes, things start to return to normal.
but yeah, very, very bright as far as the telescope's concerned. I have a question online from David Buckley and then from Lardman in the room. Uh, David, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Ian. Uh, very nice talk, Ian. Um, I'm really interested in the filamentary structure and your comments about the magnetic field uh, producing, you know, well, the reason for them. And I wasn't quite sure whether the polarization is measured of those filaments. I mean, those are continuum images, I guess, but are the polarization vectors, for example, for the linear um, produced for those images? So the, the question from David was regarding the, the galactic sensors, magnetic filaments, and whether there were polarization information available for those. So uh, such data exists in principle. Um, when we scheduled the galactic sensor survey, we, we did so with polarimetry in mind in the sense that we observed um, standard polarimetric calibrators. We also close packed the mosaic fairly tightly, reasoning that off-axis polarimetry would be quite challenging. So the data are, are set up to deliver um, polarimetry, polarimetric radio imaging of the region, um, but it just hasn't been done yet. But it's uh, it's on it's on my list. I mean, but part of the reason I'm asking is that you probably know, you know, the 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 Milky Way's um, magnetic field was mapped, or polarization was mapped many years ago by Matheson and Ford, and the recent initiative is to redo it uh, in the optical at least, and there's a a dedicated um, instrument uh, which will be surveying um, the Milky Way's um, polarization from Sutherland in the optical. So uh, it would be interesting, obviously, to compare uh, the results that come from that in a few years' time with the results from the polarization of the Meerkat data. Right. Would you be able to do it optically in the galactic sensor, though, with the many magnitudes of dusk obscuration? That's a very good question. I don't uh, I don't have an answer for that, and maybe that kills it dead immediately. I don't know. Well, but, or perhaps um, once again, the, ra the radio and the optical can be complementary, right? Maybe the radio can fill in the gaps so that the optical can't see. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, David. OK, we have a question from Lardman in the room, and then we have a question from Stabile online. And probably after that, we should wrap up because we're running out of time. Uh, I was wondering, I think it's the filaments in the X-ray images. So do we know, is that because they, they, they fade at high frequencies? And if so, we, or up to what frequencies do we observe them? Yeah, I don't know. They certainly, they certainly exist at high radio frequencies. I think synchrotron in principle produces X-ray photons, but yeah, I'm not sure the answer to that. Really. I have to ask an extra astronomer. All right. Uh, and Stabile, you want to ask a question? Unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Good. All right. Great talk. I'm so excited about all of these images, and I'm really proud to be a part of this project, especially with the, the mighty group, the Meerkat Radio Continuum Survey Group. So my questions were also about the um, filaments that at the center of the galaxy, the galactic images that you showed there. Um, you mentioned that they were non-thermal in origin. Um, do we know what type of non-thermal emission is in question? Recording in progress. <laughs> yes. Synchrotron emission, Remstrahlen. Yeah, sorry. Go on. Uh, do, we know, do we know exactly what type of non-thermal emission is coming from the filaments? Um, I think from spectral modeling of individual filament complexes with the VLA, as well as polarimetric observations with the VLA, uh, I think it's fairly well accepted universally that it's these decidedly synchrotron emission that's powering these things. Okay, all right, sounds good. And also a question quickly about the, um, the high pass filter, um, how that works. Um, does that mean within a single... Uh, observing band, you filter out the higher frequencies. Is that how you end up applying a high filter on an image? Are you, are you referring to the penultimate image I showed, the high pass filter? Yes, yes. exactly. The I one think the question, filter, yeah, applied to. 
yeah, the, the question was about the high pass filtered image that I showed at the end there. That was simply just an image processing thing. We didn't do any clever tricks with the visibilities and re-imaging or anything. Um, okay. I think it's essentially like an edge detection thing. You know, it's it, it's kind of Photoshop level territory or maybe Fourier uh -huh. transforming the image, throwing away the kind of lower Fourier modes and then, and then Fourier transforming back just to throw away the kind of, you know, large angular resolution Ooh. broad structures in the image to try to bring out the, the filaments and the, the kind of edge brightened features. Oh, I see. So you're looking at the, the small scale features in the image. Is that correct? Yeah, just to try to just to try to um, just to try to get hold of the the filaments in the image rather than okay. anything else. Really, that was the motivation behind it. Okay, understood. All right. Thanks for the question. All right. Well, we are a few minutes over time, so we should wrap up. So I would like to thank Ian again, and thanks for everyone for attending. And see you again next month, I think. I think I haven't announced it yet, but there should be an interesting talk. Uh...